Thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you, Thomas. I have a request. Can you be the timekeeper for me? And when it's a quarter of an hour, can you please give me a sign? So I don't want to take too much time up, and I'm always endangered to do that. So thanks for your assistance. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for setting this up. And Carmen Stadelmeier, thanks a lot for um, organizing all of this and bringing us together. Um, in, a, in a moment, I will go with you through only a few thoughts on um, the political and cultural impact of traditional food. Uh, first, let me recapitulate something that has been addressed today a couple of times. I was two weeks ago sitting at the southern western corner of Romania at this big river which unites us all. And I have been traveling back through Serbia, through Hungary, Austria, Germany. The river became smaller and smaller and smaller, and when I crossed it last time, there are so many wonderful crossings of this river. When you do this journey, it was rather small. It was around Ulm here. It was the day when the Brexit results came in. It was Friday, actually two weeks ago. And I regretted bitterly that we do not have this river in England that unites us all, because I am really badly affected by it. And I was very grateful that our early speaker said it was the old, the righteous old ones, the inward-looking ones, that are about to destroy the future of the young people. And this is really the most awful one. So being here today, <laughs> taking part in a conference that unites us all again, means a lot to me, so thank you. I didn't know when I was confirming my presence here that it would, would become so relevant. Um, the political impact of food in general. Um, for slow food, eating in general is a political act. If you think it's private, you are wrong. It's only partially private. Private is your decision of what to eat. But food shapes the world around us, and it shapes us, as we heard. Food connects us with all our world, the social world, the ecological world, the financial world. There is no aspect of life which is not connected to food. So food is at the center of all human activities. It is part of our culture, of our ecology, of our economy, and of our political um, stability. So sustainability in all these five dimensions refers to food to as strongly as almost to nothing else. So next time when you eat, when you make food decisions, it is your decision, but think twice. Your decision affects everything here and everything far away. It's your immediate surrounding that is affected by your decision and also far away, think of the soya production in South America. But it affects our environment and our planet Earth now as well as in the future. Food is great fun, but food is also a responsibility. Traditional food are foods that have slowly developed over time. Out of particular conditions, there are sociocultural um, conditions, biocultural ones, climatic ones, geographical ones. They are not entirely fixed over time. However, the evolution of traditional food and dishes is comparatively very slow. Advances, advances in synchronization with local cuisine and agricultural and artisan practices, and crucially, it is a grassroots phenomenon, meaning it is not tied to a particular commercial endeavor. The knowledge about traditional food is at all stages of the production consumption chain linked to and transmitted through local practices. These include agricultural ones, horticultural ones, but also the distribution, think of local markets and shops, the preparation recipes often handed down through family practices, and not at least the final consumption of food through us. And they are often linked to social events, be it the private ones within the family, public ones, such as, for example, harvest festivals we celebrate all over the world. 
This, by the way, is not a simple phenomenon in the more traditional communities, but also in our rationalized Western societies, as we drink the new wine of the season with onion bread or give out sweet pretzels to school children on St. Martin's Day. Lively practices around local foods are at the center of a virtuous cycle of promoting social cohesion, strengthening local economies, and support local small-scale food production. And in the end, and there is another political angle, defending food sovereignty. Small-scale farmers are the champions of traditional foods. They have retained strength from the past, and these are being gradually recognized as forward-looking ones, not backward-looking assets in our quest for food production systems that can feed the current and future world populations. The, the, the question just before, earlier, whether it's you know, genetic or not, I am the other side. I'm saying we need to defend our local food traditions in order to keep biodiversity, biodiversity going, which is at the basis of everything we need in order to keep soils healthy and all of that. And this is basically a battle of opinions at the moment, of convictions, and a battle of interests. The ones on the side of traditional foods have nothing to lose and nothing to gain. They, they have a lot to lose and a lot to gain in that sense, but not commercially, so they are not interesting. The other one is hugely commercial and therefore much more interesting by those who play along their interests. This is how I lose time normally, you see. Um, anyway. Traditional agricultural practices are generally less energy intensive, more eco-friendly than modern commercial farming. Mixed cropping, mixed farming systems practiced in local adaptations all over the world imitate natural ecosystems and aim to be self-supportive systems based on diversification and recycling. They contain various elements, crops as well as animals, that are integrated as nutrient exchange as well as on functional levels. They reduce the risk in farming, we have been talking about the weather, and allow for a higher intensity farming, maintain high levels of food production while at the same time sustaining the system through soil, water conservation, energy security, rainwater harvesting, cropping sequence management, multi-tier arrangements. These practices, called integrated farming systems in their modern description way, can be found in a great variety of combinations in many places in the world. They include the Three Sisters intercropping farming system of Central America, including winter squash, maize and beans, but also what we call in Germany the Streuobstwiesen, the mixed orchards of Germany, where sheep graze under a great variety of fruit trees on meadows that also produce honey and hay for other animals in species-rich semi-natural habitats. And from where you come, you remember all these things and you still have them there to a great degree. Also common are grain and legume intercropping arrangements. In Germany, often barley and lentil. In tropical areas, coconut, banana, pineapple lend themselves to multi-tier farming. Traditional systems of food production are usually closely linked to the local cuisine. Take the German example, almost of this area here, of wheat and lentil farming. Grains and legumes also combine into tasty and highly nutritious dishes, like the Schwabian dish of lentils with Spätzle, type of noodles, or pasta e ceci, pasta with chickpeas and beans and pasta soup in Italy. The Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that more than 80% of farmers worldwide are smallholders. However, there is a remarkable discrepancy between the vital role of smallholder farming and the significance attached to globally. The bulk research funding, for example, goes into technology-based agricultural so-called innovation, despite the negative human and social impacts of the Green Revolution. The loss of sustainable agricultural practices based largely on traditional knowledge has led to low productivity and widespread suffering. Smallholder farmers supply us with a great variety of high quality food around the world. They look after the countryside, especially in marginal areas such as high mountain pastures and tropical forests, and they keep mountain and coastal communities alive. They have an intimate knowledge 
of their local area and its plants and animals. That is why smallholder agriculture with the output of traditional foods in a community is a key element in a sustainable, locally adapted agriculture. In the early years of this millennium, the organization I'm speaking for, Slow Food, started two projects to protect and su develop supportive networks for smallholder agriculture and traditional foods. One is called the Ark of Taste, and it has a slogan that says, eat what you want to preserve. Basically reversing the idea that you have to keep humans out of nature and um, leave it untouched, basically like a museum. The idea is, if you have traditional food where you are, eat it, create demand, talk to the farmer, create networks. The other one is called the Presidia project, and Presidia is a complicated word. It has the, uh, has the idea that you protect a traditional food by people. Presidia are formed around these traditional foods at the risk of extinction, with the aim to protect and promote them, which can be traditional breeds or heritage food plants, but also food products such as cheeses, preserved, preserves, baked goods, or many others. Slow food has the special approach of never looking at the food stuff only on the plate or on the shop shelf, because we know that it has a wider ring, rings and rings and rings around themselves into society, as I described before, like when you drop a stone in, a, in water and all the rings come out. So food is never to be looked at um, it without a socio-economic uh, context. So naturally, the safeguarding of traditional food also involves the safeguarding about the knowledge about this food, the structures of their production, distribution, and consumption. So it's never the food alone. These foods and their context are vast resource for the present and future well-being of humanity and the planet. Protecting them means protecting diversity, biological ecosystems diversity, diversity of culture and knowledge, and not at least the diversity of taste. Where do you think do we get the taste from um, if it doesn't come from nature? Um, there are currently about 400 such pro um, products within the Slow Food uh, Presidia um, list involving more than 10,000 producers, smallholder farmers, herders, fishermen and women, and artisan producers. They are supported by us, by our foundation of biodiversity. I name only a few. Um, one of them, and I can't pronounce the name because um, I apologize, I can't, I can't speak your languages. This is a plat, plum slatko from the Drina Valley in um, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, very rich, you know it, and it's, the, the na, plum name is called um, po, Posega. Do you? Pose? Posegacha. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, okay, I learn it later with you. Um, and this is, this is one of the very important ones because uh, in the aftermath of the war there was sort of high unemployment and now we started with hundreds of women mainly um, doing that again. Works quite well. Um, another one to look into, if I had more time, is actually really the one of the lentils grown here in, not far from here. Um, which has a wonderful story because the lentil growing was lost here completely because it wasn't, it wasn't valuable anymore, it didn't make any money, the soil is difficult. And then you need always for such things to set up, to make it successful, people, people that like to work with people and the land. You need almost obsessed people in a positive sense, otherwise it doesn't work. You need drivers, you need leaders, you need people who want to make things with people and not people who just go with their shopping trolley to the cheapest discounter. That doesn't work. In that attitude, we do not create a better world. Um, if, we look, if I look at what? Cereal and bread, we have dug out with all the communities, uh, the slow food communities along the Danube. It doesn't look that good. I think we need a lot of help from you. There is one in Germany. There are two in Austria. It's the Waldstaude rye, old rye varieties and their breads. In Hungary, we have nothing. That doesn't mean there isn't anything. We, it just means we haven't got the people who bring it to us. Um, in Serbia, we have a sort of mountain buckwheat bread and a bread made with white corn meal. In Romania, a little bit better. There's the bread tradition apparently uh, stronger 
at least in the perception of the people who work with slow food. There we have the traditional ones we have seen on Gunther's uh, presentation before. And Bulgaria still waiting for Nadeshta, I think. Um, so there is a lot we can do in order to raise the profile and the recognition of um, these products. In short, we have done a study by two universities in 2012 um, that assesses the socio-cultural, the agri-environmental and the economic results of producers that dare to do that, like the Slatko ones, like the bread ones. <coughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, it all comes out incredibly positive. So if you, if you are interested in that study, I can direct you to the homepage of Slow Food where it is. It is a solid study that gives a sound explanation of the economic positive effect and all the others as well. The only negative side of it is that um, alternative energy use comes out not that well yet. So in terms of packaging and all the other things. But there is something we can do. I summarize and finish. A sound local economy, sustainable agriculture that is considerate of the environment, the cultural identity of communities, of animal welfare, the lively existence of biocultural diversity of traditional food are together vital to food sovereignty. The right of every community to decide for itself what it grows, produces, and eats, and also how, to a certain degree. <coughs> this is of particular importance in the countries of the global south, where often food is not simply a question of improving the quality of life, but rather concerns the very survival of the people, communities, and cultures. However, we, we here in relatively wealthy slow food, uh, slow food Europe have also a task at hand to support the biocultural di bio diversity of our food, which makes regions, landscapes unique, communities unique, and are central to our identity and our food sovereignty. It's time for all of us to stand up and fight for this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ursula, for this Flammenrede. That's, I think that's, there is nothing to add to that. Um, 